good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining the webinar this morning for the Reverse Environmental Degradation Africa and Asia uh, Program Grand Call. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to get going with the agenda today. So before we get cracking, I just want to introduce everyone that we've got on the call from the Reddit team. So we've got myself, as uh, that's Jonathan Haspel from the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We've got on the uh, International Institute for Environment Development Reddit team, we have James Mayers, who will be speaking today. Beth Down, who's also speaking today. On Q&A support, we have Steve Bass and Janine Duffy. Ali Brown will be providing uh, support if you've got any questions about technical issues. Melanie Valfre and Rosalind Goodrich are also uh, on the line and may answer any questions that are relevant to them. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have uh, the, an overview of the program that will be led by James. We're going to talk through the first grant call and that will be led with Beth and James. We'll have 30 minutes for questions and answers. So we'll be taking them from the Q&A uh, button that will, and Steve and Janine will be helping field that towards us or as part of the Reddit team. And then we'll have five minutes at the end as a quick wrap up and where to find out more information about the research call. So I'm gonna pass this out uh, over to James now. James is gonna provide an overview of the Reddit program. Thank you very much, John. And hello, everybody. Um, the Reversing Environmental Degradation in Africa and Asia program, REDA for short, is um, a UK FCDO program and it's being delivered in partnership with the International Institute for Environment and Development, IAED. We've commissioned or carried out um, 12 different scoping studies, um, reviewing evidence and opinion, making recommendations. And these have really helped shape the, the radar strategy. Um, they're all on the website, and I do urge you to have a, a look at them. We've also consulted on the findings of these studies um, with a range of people and have co-designed the, the main elements of radar strategy with some key institutions in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And the radar strategy that we have come up with through this process identifies the program's role as supporting and catalyzing research, communications, and action by locally led initiatives to help people and nature thrive together in a changing climate, enabling people to use nature sustainably, be more resilient to climate change, and enabling nature to moderate local weather and global carbon. In Red, I will try and do this through a program of competitive grant calls, technical support to grantees and spreading the knowledge generated. Red R grants will fund locally led initiatives, initiatives that support indigenous peoples and local communities that positively address action for nature and climate and gender equality and social inclusion. And address one or more of these five thematic priorities, local research and capability for research. This is ev evidence generation that's locally led, inclu including on local and traditional knowledge. Resource and land use assessments, and this might, might be large integrated multi-objective part, or participatory natural resource and land use assessments, decision support tools, other things like that. Business models, financing mechanisms, looking to establish both um, um, better mechanisms and better flows of finance that are direct, patient and long term and inclusive governance systems. So we're asking for initiatives to focus on one or more of these th thematic priorities in addition to nature, climate, gender, equality, and social inclusion. And radar initiatives can take place in one or more eligible countries. And we've got on our strategy, the, the list of, of UK government um, um, defined eligible countries. 
in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Um, we, we'd strongly recommend that you look at the work in the scoping studies and, and in thinking about uh, a propose, proposing an initiative, demonstrate your rationale for, for location and scale. We're not, we're not prescribing it. The sorts of ecosystems that might be the focus, peatland, wetland, dryland, forest, coastal ecosystems, and all their interlinkages. And um, it may be a appropriate to, to consider the effects of urban rural change and demographic change on these ecosystems. And on that technical support and knowledge management, the two uh, of the three components, along with grants that the, the Red R program seeks to, to offer, in the coming months, we'll identify with, with grantees the, the sorts of technical support that can be useful to them, and some of which may be provided by, by other grantees, we hope. Um, and these may be in areas including um, shaping policy with evidence, really trying to have impact with, with good research and good work um, on the, the issues of equity, intersectionality and social inclusion and on uh, operational methods and ways for monitoring, evaluating and, and learning from initiatives. And we'll develop the knowledge management platform, trying to find the best way to, to integrate and fit with other knowledge management efforts to help spread the knowledge generated among a wider community of practice. Um, next slide, please, and handing over to you, Beth. Thanks, James. Um, so in this first grant call, we're funding what we're referring to as medium-sized project grants, which are between £200,000 and £500,000, and lasting between two and four years, starting from January next year. This first call has a two-stage application process, with stage one concept notes closing on the 31st of July. And we're hoping to fund around 18 to 21 projects in this first round. So to, to put the current grant call into context, um, we wanted to share with you all our tentative plans for future calls under REDAR. Um, the details of each of these calls is subject to change as we'll be learning and adapting as we move through the programme. Um, but we hope this gives you a rough idea of REDAR's intentions over its five year lifetime. So this current grant call uh, uh, in the green circle on the left is um, focusing on those mid-sized project grants of 200 to 500,000 pounds over two to four years. And that's, that's largely because our in-region consultations told us that this level of grant is often the most useful for the kinds of projects we're seeking to fund. And we wanted to get some good sized initiatives up and running as soon as possible. Next year, we plan to launch a call for smaller catalytic grants of around 50 to 100,000 pounds with a shorter time frame of six to 12 months. And these catalytic grants are intended to be used by smaller and mid-sized in-region organisations to build new partnerships and or develop capacity and capability for leading on a larger project or programme grant, with the main output being a strong proposal for a future call. Um, and those catalytic grants might also be used by organisations to move an existing or previous piece of research through to action and impact on the ground. After that, we plan to launch a call for large programme grants of up to one and a half million pounds, and thereafter to issue a mixture of further small catalytic grants and project or programme grants. We're actively considering the shape and focus of grant calls two and three so that we can provide sufficient time for applicants to create proposals. So the timings and the exact scope and scale of these future funding rounds is to be confirmed, um, but this is just to give you a feel for what future calls may look like under Redar. So who can apply for funding? Um, proposals must name one lead organisation, which will be the grant holder, responsible for the delivery and management of the project. That lead organisation must be a non-profit, which may include research institutes and universities, community-based organisations and NGOs. 
the lead organisation may form partnerships and issue subgrants or consultancy contracts to other non-profits or to private sector companies. They may wish to form partnerships with government agencies and departments, and this is encouraged, but governments, intergovernmental organisations and UN agencies cannot receive Red R funds. So those partnerships would need to be in-kind or funded through co-funding, not Red R funds. Private sector organisations can receive Red R funds through subgrants or consultancies, but they can't lead on proposals. And Red R does have the ambition to be as locally led as possible. So we will be prioritising proposals led by organisations based within our focal regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Southeast Asia. That said, we might fund a minority of proposals led by organisations based outside those regions, but those proposals will have to demonstrate really strong partnerships with in-regional organisations, including the local community level, and give a robust case for how the project is fulfilling the locally led requirement. So once the 31st of July submission deadline has passed, the concept notes will go through three stages of review. The first SIFT will be carried out by programme staff at IIED to filter out any ineligible or incomplete concept notes. Then eligible and complete concept notes will be allocated to three panel reviewers each, and those reviewers will independently score the concept notes against the seven criteria listed here. And there's more detail in the guidance documents online. Um, the panel reviewer scores, comments and recommendations will then be shared with the Red R Steering Committee, who will take a, a programme wide view and make final decisions as to which applicants are invited to stage two, based on the potential portfolio of grants that could be funded. Stage two full proposals will follow a similar review process, but at stage two the assessment will include more of the operational aspects, sorry. <laughs> more of the operational aspects such as team and management structure and value for money. So moving on to how to apply, um, this shows the plan timetable for Grant Call 1, following a two-stage application process. Um, stage 1 concept notes must be submitted in the online application portal before the end of July. Those will undergo review and selection through the month of August and then successful concept note applicants will be invited to develop a full proposal for stage two through September and October. Those will go through review and selection in November, and then final successful proposals will be offered grant agreements subject to due diligence checks in December. And we'll then aim to get first payments out and for projects to start from January next year. Um, at a minimum, applicants should read the Red R strategy document and the guidance for applicants, which are both available on the Red R website via the links shown on the, uh, yeah, on the strat there's a strategy page and then a, a resources page for the guidance. Um, and these two documents are essential reading for understanding what kinds of projects this call is seeking to fund, so please do make sure you read those before applying. Um, as James mentioned earlier, we also strongly encourage you to take a look at the reports from the scoping studies and in region consultations, as those have helped to shape our strategy. Um, so applications must be submitted using the online IIED grants platform, which uses a system called FlexiGrant, and the URL is shown here, it's grants.iied.org. Concept note applications must be made by the lead applicant. Um, <clears throat> this will be the named project leader who will take responsibility for the project on behalf of the lead organisation. Lead applicants will need to first set up an account in the platform by clicking the uh, register button up at the top right or down by the call info box at the bottom of that screenshot there. And then once you have an account set up, you'll be able to log in and start an application. So the guidance for applicants document takes you through the online concept note form in more detail, and it gives screenshots and guidance notes for each question. So please do go through that document first, and if anything's still unclear or not working as it should um, <clears throat> in the online platform, please let us know straight away via the inquiries email address. 
And the resources page on the Red R website also has a word version of the concept note form, which you can use for drafting your concept note and sharing it with partners. But the final application will need to be done in the online platform. So we'll open up for questions in a moment, but just while you're thinking about your questions or typing it up in the Q&A box, um, if after this webinar and after you've read the strategy and guidance documents, you still have queries or you find problems with the forms or anything else, um, please do get in touch straight away via the inquiries email address. That's inquiries at redr.org. And that mailbox is checked at least once a day, Monday to Friday and we'll aim to get a response back to you as soon as possible and um, certainly within a day or two. Um, please also check out the website at www.redr.org where you can find all the resources documents, the scoping study reports and other bits of news from the programme. You can also sign up on the website to the Redr email newsletter um, so, that we can, so that you can stay informed about the programme and future announcements. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn via the handles shown here. Yeah, so I think we can open for questions. Um, so I'll ask my colleagues just to guide us to the most commonly asked questions first, and we'll try and get, try to address as many of those possible now on the webinar. Um, but if we don't get through them, if we run out of time, we will address others offline and then make a, a Q&A written document available in the next week. Thanks, Beth. Um, it's Steve uh, Bass. I've been <clears throat> looking at the questions and fielding them. Uh, it's great to see so many, 45 questions so far, trying to field some of them. Many of the questions are about eligibility, um, particularly uh, of public uh, research institutions, the process for UN agencies to get involved. Um, I'll defer to James for the answer, but but no public research institution or UN agency is disqualified from applying how um, or if they receive funding is is, um, is is another matter, I think, context specific. There are questions about um, people from countries outside the focal regions. Can they apply? I, I believe the answer is a yes for that. Um, quite a few questions. Um, if if you receive a grant for um, the first round or the second round, does that preclude you from further grants later in the Red R program? Or actually the opposite? Can you, to qualify for say the third grant, do you need to have had a, a first or second um, round grant? So uh, again, I'll defer. Can you make more than one application as an as a, um, institution? can uh, lead applicants beyond more than one proposal. There's um, quite a few comments on the the local nature, you know, locally registered international NGOs with local partners, are, are they um, eligible? Um, and also at the other end of the scale with uh, local institutions, um, does, does our minimum... Uh, turnover requirement disqualify some very local institutions what is the logic of that um, minimum turnover um, again I'll defer to others for the answers I'm just looking at the set of uh, questions here a few saying we're not research institutions as such but we're involved in progressive business or technology uh, how far can we um how far would Red Art entertain proposals about the, the furtherance, the scaling up, the application of that technology locally? Uh, and if so, do we have to have a, a research partner? Um, the same with, with business. So there's a few there um, for you, James, for, for Beth. Um, Janine, you may want to add on other sorts of questions. And uh, the, in the time I've been speaking, there's been another twin five questions so we will definitely have a, a considered response available to everyone on the website afterwards Janine thank you Steve no I think you did a really good job um synthesizing the vast majority of questions so I'll hand over to the team to start I, with I'm, I'm uh, thanks Janine I must also add there are quite a few questions on co-funding back to you James and Ben 
if I go from the top, I've I've ordered them by most upvotes. Um, so if we go through them in that order. Um, so the first one on my screen is um, from Holly Hughes at Practical Action. Um, can you define locally led from an eligibility perspective? Um, can an INGO with local registrations lead the application? Um, James, I don't know if you want, did you want to give the radar definition of locally led? Sure. Um, um, and maybe this will, will um, help with a number of uh, um, questions asked. Um, as, as you said earlier, uh, Beth, we're, we're um, defining locally led as initiatives that uh, engage residents in their design and implementation and uh, their leadership has strong local involvement. Uh, they're likely to employ and empower women and youth and show concrete benefits for local communities. Um, um, so um, organizations at, at the local level um, are likely to, to um, lead that, that effort um, um, in, in demonstrating that. Um, uh, international NGOs with local registrations might also demonstrate that locally led um, e effect very strongly they will need to um, show how they how they do that in their in their application um, and in their partnerships but potentially yes is the answer to the second part of that that first question um, I hope that sort of covers one or two other uh, inquiries about um, um, locally led, and then the the kind of lead organisation. Um, um, uh, there are questions about whether there should be one of those. Yes, there should be one one lead organisation, and then as many um, um, partnerships with others as is appropriate. And sub grantees can be of the 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 sorts you defined, Beth. Um, and that lead organization um, needs to be a, a non-profit organization. Uh, it needs to be able to demonstrate that it is the sort of um, um, effective supporter of indigenous peoples and local communities um, um, through its systems and experience, that it is um, financially sound and uh, appropriately staffed and with uh, effective um, technical and financial capacity. Okay, thank you, James. So next on the um, questions, uh, similarly, what are the eligibility requirements for sub awardees of a project? Um, so those would be other nonprofit organisations that the lead can sub grant to. Um, and private sector organisations could also be sub awardees and receive receive funds. Um, although they, they can't they can't lead, but they could be sub sub awardees. Um, and the sub sub awardees might be smaller organisations that might not be eligible to actually lead, but the lead organisation um, can demonstrate that they can they can manage those partners and manage the risk involved in terms of financial risk. Um, yeah, anything to add, James? I think that's no, and they can be good. they they can be based wherever makes sense for the for the project. So as long as you can um explain in your proposal, and this would come in the stage two full proposal, if you can explain um how the the partnership is set up and how it will how it's structured to um, deliver the project in the best way um, and you can justify those partnerships and, and that they're the best partners uh, for the project then I think that's the most important thing. We, we've, we've made no rule about co-funding have we um, the next one on the, the, the list? No, so co-funding, um, we would encourage um, if you if you can 
secure co-funding to support the project or to increase the scope um that's great and we would we would love to see details about that in stage two in the full in the full proposal um we're not asking for any details of co-funding in the concept notes um but do do bear it in mind and if it if it needs to be um if it needs to be factored in uh yeah do do start to plan that in um we're not asking for a certain percentage of co-funding to be met and we're not um asking for it to be mandatory so if you don't have any co-funding if if this is the only fund that will fund your project that's also fine do you want to take that one um from ashley brooks about the minimum turnover um uh yeah. prejudicing against um, um smaller organizations Yes, so Ashley Brooks, thank you for the question, um, which uh, for everyone else, the minimum turnover amount, minimum four times the annual amount granted, disqualifies many local organisations. This goes against the grant's intention to be locally led as it largely precludes the small local NGOs. Will there be flexibility on this? Um, so, yes, I, yeah, I understand um, your concern about this. Um, however, in at least in this grant call in the first one, we do need to make sure that the lead organisation has a certain level of um, financial stability and fi financial capacity in terms of its management systems and reporting systems to manage a grant of this level. Um, but our, our aim is to be supporting the supporters. So we want that lead organisation to be those well positioned organizations in the region who can um, get the funds out to those smaller um, organizations who 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 aren't at that level to be able to to lead at this time. Um, yes, I think that's answered the question. Um, and and your point about uh, in the uh, next round, um hopefully in the early part of next year some catalytic grants will be um, um available for the smaller organizations on, on the, that end of the spectrum yes exactly so those smaller ones that don't meet that um turnover uh criteria won't be eligible to lead on this yeah. one they will be eligible to be a sub grantee um but they would be um, potentially eligible to go in for those smaller catalytic grants um, and use those funds to to build their capacity and um, uh, to build systems to enable them to manage uh, larger larger projects. Just if I could come in on a, a couple, uh, there are a number of questions around the balance between capacity building, research, uh, technology. Um, people saying uh, we're focused more on capacity building rather than research would we be eligible we're focusing on technology rather than research I think the no the notion of this uh, particular program is research to action um, what what we have the shift we've made here compared to many standard research programs in this area is to engage local organizations who are very often rooted in uh, technology who need capacity so I think the answer here is that yes you may have a capacity lead yes you may have a technology lead but the whole program wants to learn about um, success so you would need to build into your program some kind of learning process so that the the research to action learnings could be shared and scaled up uh, across across the um across the program so it's quite different from your traditional abstract research uh, program in that sense there are also questions people have put in the chat uh, rather than uh, q and a and and three of those questions are um at, on the research side of it can the program fund postdocs, PhDs? <clears throat> I think in principle, yes, because uh, the program wishes to build uh, research capacity, local research capacity within the country. So if there is some postdocs or researchers 
who are very much engaged with the local research to action or who are from those countries, the, the, the scope to build in that kind of um, uh, seen, uh, high level tertiary training is, is, um, would be welcomed. So there's just a, um, um, a few further things there. <clears throat> Back to you, James. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Steve. Um, um, just it's good to to cover um, some of the questions that are in the in the chat, but um, good also if uh, people can convert them into the the Q and A um, list as well, and that, that, that'll enable us to answer them um, ultimately um, more effectively. I think. Um, could I just add another one? There's a there's a lot about the balance between climate focused work and nature focused work, and uh, as we've said, this is about a work that would enable people and nature to thrive together in a in a changing climate. So, what what would you want to say about that uh, that balance? If it's more nature led, if it's more climate led, what would be a, um, appropriate? I, I think um, the stress that's come out of all the scoping work is to is to um, is on the word balance uh, and to to um, um, really um, demonstrate in any particular um, context, location, or um, um, issue area um, what. Um, is going to work um, to enable um, people and nature to thrive in a in a, as the climate changes, um, and that's I th I think um, uh, demonstrable in pat particular places by um, specific initiatives, and be convincing about that in 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 a proposal and. Uh, um, that will achieve the, the red R goals. It's really um, all of those things, um, uh, all of the the the, the three things uh, in 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 a local situation. Um, James, there's a question here. Um, how does this fund differ from existing UK government funding in this area? such as the Global Centre for Biodiversity and Climate and the Darwin Initiative. Are you able to tackle that one? Maybe John can help with this one as well. Yeah, I think uh, uh, John should probably do that one. Yeah, happy to. Um, it's a really good question. So I think part of, part of this could relate to the overall uh, tapestry of UK research funding and the different focuses. So the UK, the Global Centre on Biodiversity uh, and Climate is a Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs programme, and they have a focus on food security and natural resource management and agricultural practices. Our research call under the REDA programme is very focused on what can enable uh, nature and climate to thrive together. So it's got that people focus front and centre, and I think that comes out in our five thematic priorities. The, the Darwin Initiative is a separate initiative, um, again, looking at biodiversity and those are different research calls. So it, it is a great question. And these are complementary initiatives and we are working across the UK government to make sure that we are capitalizing on those synergies, but they do have an important difference based on what the, the primary focus of the research calls and the ultimate focus of what the program is trying to achieve. Okay, so back, back, back over to Beth and James, if there's any, anything else you want to add to that, but I think I've covered it. Thanks, John. Um, there's a question here, how many proposals can one organisation submit? And that's a nice, easy one. Um, so the, the lead organisation, the organisation can be lead um, on multiple proposals um, and there's no cap. Um, but we would encourage the organisation to um, talk within the organisation and, and make sure that the competitive ones are being put forward. Um, however, there is a, a cap on who the lead applicant can be. So if you're a lead applicant as an individual, you can only lead on one proposal. So the organisation can can lead on multiple. 
but the individual lead can only lead on one. Jumping in again, top of the list. Oh, I see Janine is um, typing a, an answer to explain re research to action. Thank you, Janine. Um, um, dealt with the, the one on maximum number of partners in a consortium. Um, Pauline Kiamba asks, is it acceptable to use data and information from previous related research or do we have to generate the research work from the beginning? Um, previous um, research is um, um, if it is it is going somewhere if it is um, um, data that um, um, really deserves to be um, developed or um, um, have um, uh, um, greater impact with very much um, appropriate to, to focus a, an initiative on. James, on that score, there are a couple of others about um, research into action. I think we should emphasize that it is not, it's not essential for the applicant to conduct brand new research. However, it is essential to find the most relevant knowledge, which could be local knowledge, could be indigenous knowledge, uh, and um, verify, validate its usefulness in context, and then spread that knowledge. So the research doesn't have to have been done uh, by the applicant, um, but it has to be, um, the case needs to be made that this is worth um, taking into action. So in that sense, again, it's quite different from um, a, a sort of primary research project. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, Adigla Apollinieri Wejagnon asks about agroforestry. Um, um, systems and the eligibility, yes, very much so eligible. Um, Holly Hughes, um, are there priority countries in each of the regions? Um, only in the sense of uh, um, uh, eligible countries in each of the regions, um, and that covers pretty much all the countries in uh, each of the regions. Except for um, any that are high income countries are not eligible, um, high income by the um, DAC yeah. OVA, um, definitions. And also there's a there's a there are a, a small number of countries that aren't eligible because of the um, political or security situation there at the moment. And those are all detailed in the um, in the guidance document and in the strategy document, I believe. James, do you want to address Doreen Nguyen's question, which is echoed by others? Is it possible to have a collaboration across countries and across regions? And if so, does there need to be a local presence uh, or registered entity in each country? I think we would encourage, but maybe you want to um, elaborate. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm not seeing that particular one, but I, I heard it from you, Steve. Um, yes, uh, collaborations across countries uh, certainly eligible across regions um, possible um, too um, we would sort of imagine uh, the the possibilities of collaborations across uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia as as perhaps more likely than um, between uh, Asia and Africa um, but if uh, that if such collaborations are proposed they uh, certainly be um, considered um, and James, at the other end of the, the scale, there's a question from Arlene Christie Listerio um, about the scale of the project. Are, are projects required to cover a whole country wide or can it be just focused, uh, for example, on one city? Lo location um, is to be um, justified, we, su we suggest. Um, um and um scale uh, would a, would accompany that so it could be very small scale it could be it certainly could be um um the effects of um um the a city's population on ecosystems and issues associated or uh, dynamics associated with um um people in cities and nature um 
It could be um, a very small uh, location uh, in a rural area that's a focus of um, 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 people, nature, climate action. Uh, it could be, it could indeed be countrywide, perhaps if it was in particular about um, um, the, the effect of um, 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 better used evidence to um, to um, try and change decision making about um, ecosystems and, and landscapes across a whole country. One of the things that we just slightly overlooked that I'll pass over to Beth. Um, there is a question on what are payment terms, for example, is it in arrears or in advance? I think that's probably a good question based on the type of institutions that are likely to apply for this call. Yes, so um, I think if the lead organisation is based within our um, focal regions, our standard payment terms would normally be um, quarterly advance payments, but with uh, the final payment of the year or the project being based on actuals, actual expenditure, so that it would, it would um, in all likelihood be a mixture of the two, mainly advance and then uh, an actuals arrears payments at the end. Um, there might be a few exceptions to that way we want to tweak it. So if uh, we, we spoke about funding a minority of projects with the, where the lead isn't based within those regions. So for example, if we if we were to issue a grant to um, uh, a UK university, um, we might um, decide to do all the payments in arrears. Um, it, it really depends, and this, this is where the due diligence checks come in as well, so the outcomes of those will determine a few exceptional cases where we might want to do things differently based either on the ability of the organisation to um, fund things um, in advance themselves or based on the level of risk. Uh, so, yeah, there, there are a few we don't have a hard, hard and fast rule for all organisations, but it might just depend on what comes out of those due diligence checks. There's a, a question or several questions, I think, about um, the types of, of research um, um, that might be um, a, appropriate focus. And uh, is this really um, um, a programme that's emphasising one, one type over an, another? Um, uh, I, I suggest um, <laughs> not. Um, we, we, we're re really trying to support improvement in the evidence base on, on key ecosystems and livelihoods and how to move from degraded to um, restored ecosystems. Um, so paying attention to ecological, ecological concerns, yes, but also to the social, political, economic issues. Um, we're, 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 we're keen that evidence really should be scientific, involving clear research questions or hypotheses and, and systematic observation, um, and that it should be uh, rigorous, and that same rigor should apply to the, 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 the action part um, too. Um, so carefully designing things, um, uh, designing methods and conclusions, and um, in the case of, of research, um, rigor in terms of being uh, explicit, um, uh, public, potentially replicable, and, and, and certainly sort of open to, to, to critique. Um, um, methods can be uh, qualitative or participatory. Um, as well as quantitative, um, um, they would often need to be, I think, um, combining um, um, disciplines and um, able to to explore diverse stakeholder perspectives. Um, and as we've stressed, all initiatives uh, in 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 particular need to demonstrate how they're they're tackling gender equality and social inclusion. So. Um, uh, there, if there's research involved, it's it's likely to need to demonstrate that. So there's a couple at the 
top of the list here that I can probably deal with. Um, so Joe asks, does the organisation that is lead need to register on Flexi Grant first, or is it just the lead applicant that registers? Um, it's just the lead applicant. It's the individual who needs to create an account on Flexi Grant. Um, and that person would then need to um, enter the details of their organization. Um, so the organization's address, contact details, et cetera. But it would be that individual lead applicant who needs to do that. Um, and then uh, Gosu asks, is there a maximum number of partners in a consortium for application? And can a European institution be partner in a consortium for application? Um, so there's no maximum number of partners um, in a consortium. Um, you'll just need to justify the, the, the size of the partnership and, and consider, um, consider the roles of each of them in, in delivering the project and, and also value for money aspects. So where's the money going and where, how is it going to make the biggest impact um, for the amount funded? So no, no prescribed maximum number, um, so it's up to you to justify how, how your consortium looks. Um, and European institutions would, would be eligible to be sub, sub-granted. Um, they, they could also be eligible to lead, but as, as we said, we're not focusing on, um, we're not prioritising those, so they would need to have a strong justification to, to be leading on the projects but they would be eligible to, to receive funds as long as they're a non-profit um, or a private sector organisation. Do you want to do the one about um, how many applica applications will be taken through to stage two by anonymous attendee? Beth. We haven't set a, uh, a certain number that would be taken through, so I th the process will be um, based on the scoring from the panel reviewers um, I think if if concept notes receive consistently lower scores from the panel reviewers, then those would um, likely be rejected um, at that, that concept note stage. And then um, concept notes that receive consistently high scores or a mixture of scores would go to the steering committee to make final decisions. Um, and those final decisions in terms of who's going to be invited to stage two would rest on the, um, the scores and the, the comments received from the panel reviewers, but also how the potential portfolio of, of um, projects looks. So uh, would they be covering a nice range of geographies, ecosystems, landscapes, um, and the, the type of thematic content that they're seeking to address? So it's about the it's about the scores um, that they receive from the reviewers, but also about, about the portfolio of work that we could fund with the resources available. Filippo asks, can we have partnership with neighboring countries? Um, yes, Filippo. Um, can we use the funds from the grant to delineate key biodiversity areas, asks Joshua Sese Bichanga. Yes. James, um... So latter questions on what sort of projects have been successful here. Now, we must be clear that this is the first round of a new program, but we have learned from what we think have been successful projects and approaches through uh, scoping across three regions. Do you want from the top of your head to sort of summarise, you know, what might look like uh, a successful project in terms of the distinctive characteristics of a radar uh, grant and its difference. It's, you know, it's locally led, it's nature and climate. Um, maybe as a sort of way to summarise the kind of things we're hoping for. I could try. Um, um, uh... I, th I think the phrasing you just used is the as at the the core of it. Um, a a successful radar supported initiative will be um, will have um, local impact from being locally led. Will uh, improve the relationship between, um, in particular, indigenous peoples and local communities and their. Uh, the the nature that 
they have the right and interest to manage um, and in doing that um, um, uh, have made uh, progress in ad uh, adapting to and engaging with a changing um, climate. Um, I think that would typically um, um, uh, manifest in, in clear um, um, positive impact for um, a, a diverse range of stakeholders in that local context uh, and uh, in an in, an improved situation um, uh, in terms of the the um, involvement of those stakeholders in in the decisions involved so deciding um, uh, uh, about the the relationship between people and nature um, at a local level uh, being a, an effect from the work so evidence will have been um, perhaps improved certainly better used to make that happen um, uh, it's likely that capability for um, uh, generating or or wielding that evidence will have will have been improved through the initiative um, to make that happen um, and uh, what else that that relatively modest um, um, funds and forms of support and um, um, ways in which um, information is wielded um, have all been um, efficiently and equitably used in the process. Thanks a lot, James. Um, just conscious of the time that we're getting close to the end of the session. Um, it's really great that people can put in their contact details in the chat. Unfortunately, due to uh, regulation, we can't share details of everyone who's um, participate today, but what you can do is if you, you are happy to share your content details of those who have done, please put that in the chat and liaise with each other that way. Um, we, we will try our best to collate and answer all the questions. So if there's a replication of questions, we'll pull that into a general Q&A. There are specific questions that need uh, more nuanced follow-up. We'll do our best endeavors to do that. I think that's right, isn't it, Beth? Um, just in case, yeah, we've got a nod. Fantastic. What, uh, as a reminder, please go to redder.org. So that is R E D D, sorry, R E D A A dot org to go onto the website to get access to all of our resources. That's the scope of studies, it's the Redder strategy, it's our governance document, it's our uh, handbook about how to apply. And we really encourage you to take a look at all those documents, really look at the strategy. Um, and we strongly encourage you to look at scoping studies. Um, please also look into the website to be able to sign up to the mailing list. And as a final reminder that the first stage of the, this particular uh, research call round ends on the 31st of July, so please get your applications in then. Uh, the final thing for me to say in the uh, note in the time is thank you so much for everyone who's participated today and thanks to everyone from IOD for answering the questions. It's been really great to get to see such a wealth of people from across um, different countries and organisations that have participated today. I'm really hoping that you're excited about that, the call that we've launched. We're really excited and looking forward to see what we, applications we get and what sort of proposals we'll end up funding. So uh, I'll wrap up today and just say thank you very much. I hope to, it's been useful and we look forward to you taking your applications. Thanks, everyone.